Hello everybody, uh, today I will solve code forces round 414. As you can see there is just 20 seconds before the round starts, so I'll try to explain my thoughts about the problems. And I hope you enjoy viewing, and good luck to everybody who participates. So usually it is useful to open all problems in the beginning in case there are some issues with the website later. Although recently it was usually fine. So we have seven problems. And scoring is somewhat usual. Let's start with the easy one. Here there's a line and of saves and there are n bank nodes x i in h. Oh no, eighth bank note is in safe x i and the leg is in a. And there are two guards to the left and to the right. Okay, seems that we should just sum a range of an array. Yeah, it's not clear what is a trick. Probably there is no trick. Just super easy problem. Okay, so we just need first number doesn't really matter, we just have our boundaries. B is less than C. And now we just go through the positions of all banknotes and check whether it falls in a range. Yeah, not sure if... Yeah, what is the trick here? Yeah, like this, right? seems so. I guess this is a combined division 1, division 2 round, so maybe that's why there are such beautiful problems. Okay, this one we can submit. And hopefully it passes pretests. We can look at the scoreboard quickly. Yeah, nothing unexpected here. Somebody solved B already. Nice. Did they solve both A and B? Oh no. Okay, so what happens with B? Here we want to cut a triangle, isosceles triangle, into n equal areas. And we need to determine where to cut. So distances from apex. So distance from apex area is proportional square of the distance from apex. So I guess we just need to divide the square into equal parts, right? So here we read the list of positions and where to divide and what is the total height now we just need to print the values so here it would be i divided by i times h times h divided by n and square root of this, right? Oh yeah, I guess we can multiply by h outside. Yeah. Another very tricky problem, basically the idea is that 
area of a triangle is proportional to square of its height and yeah seems to work okay let's submit this one as well okay so so far not much actually a couple of attempts on problem c let's see what's going on here So, there are two players, each player has n letters, and each player can take one of his letters and put it to any position in the string. And one of them wants to make lexicographically smallest name, and the other wants to have this graphically largest name so I guess here yeah we should just see what happens so first player can make the uh, the name start suppose the smallest letter that the first player has is uh, let's say D then he can make the name start with D, but can he do better? I guess only in case the total length is even, then he can in theory force a second player to put a letter here. And all letters of the second player are D or better. Then he can just forget about the first position and uh, okay so basically if, if at some point all letters of second player are strictly less than all letters of first player uh, and first player then should just put his letters to the rightmost position because whenever he puts it to the left he loses information loses puts smallest of his letters actually not not smallest even he should put yeah I guess he should find the certain amount of his smallest letter and put them starting from right to left in this order from larger to smaller and then the second player's optimal strategy would be to put his letters also from right to left. Yeah, and I guess not much. But as soon as the first second player has a letter that is bigger than all letters of the first player, then the first player should put his smallest letter to first position. Otherwise second player will make it worse. And then we similarly switch, right? So I guess, yeah, that's basically it, right? So they start and first player will see whether he has any letter that is better than letter smaller than letter second player. And if yes, he will put it. And then the reverse happens for the rest of the string. Okay, so this we can implement. Sounds a bit tricky, but should be fine, I think. So, okay, so we start by leading the reading those strings, and then we need to count the number of occurrences of each letter in each string. I guess we can read words. We can have this function that reads a string and count the letters. Uh, and they're all lowercase English letters. Okay, so now we have now we have this uh, count sets and then we should 
basically put the first player puts uh, the smallest letter he has Uh, yeah, the smallest letter he has into the result. Mm, oh, we also need the length from this reading function. Okay, let's just make a hack. Don't do this with your real programs. Okay, so again, so basically, f where the first is, the current player is to move. If the second player has a worse letter, then he should put to the beginning his best letter. And if second player doesn't have worse letters, then he should compute, basically allocate a certain number of letters and put. Okay, so here we go. Here we have left and right. So we still have to fill this segment and then we go in steps. And then here is this move of the first player. So for him, we find his maximum letter. Mm, or his minimum letter, right? And then we find the maximum letter of the other player. And so yes, or if the minimum letter of this player is smaller than the maximum letter of the other player, then we should take this letter and put it to, to the left position. Otherwise, we should see how many letters will this player place and put them, put it to uh, to corresponding position on the right. Okay, so here we will go. And in the end, we just print this. Okay, no stupid in. Uh, so here uh, we need to count so this player will further place uh, length minus i divided by 2. Uh, okay, so if i is equal to len minus 1, this will be 0. If i is equal to len minus 2, this will be 1, which is not good. So we should have this, right? So if len equal 2 and i is 0, then it should be 0. And if len equal 3 and i equals 0, it should be 1. Yeah, so this is how much, actually, including this one. So yeah, including this one, we have this. Okay, so now this is the number of placements and so now we do this uh, okay so while a main oh yeah but we need to find the position yeah right so while we have enough here then we subtract and continue taking the next uh, lesson next letter so for example if Remaining letters is one, and uh, then to go will be zero. And as soon as we have a positive, we put the so we will put the minimum. Yeah, that sounds good. And then we do this to the right position. And then we have to do the same for the second player, but changing the values, the priorities, right? So. Okay, so here again, yeah, if minimum is less than maximum, uh, 
Then the second player should put the maximum to the first position, otherwise first player will make it worse, right? So here we do this. Otherwise, again, this is a number of... Yes, yeah, similar, but from the other end. Okay, yes, I guess so. Yeah, it seems correct, but maybe I'm missing something. Let's see what happens here. Yeah, it passes the samples. Okay, let's see, did I mess up something when copy-pasting? So at least it's symmetric now, but is it the right thing? Yeah, obviously it should be symmetric, right? So if my proof before was meaningful, then it should be fine, I think, yes. But why, actually? Oh, I guess... Yes. The room. No, actually. No, no, this is not correct. So the second part is not correct again. So second player wants to maximize. So if his maximum letter is better than the other's minimum letter. Oh yeah, that's true, right? So. Yeah, but no, it seems correct. Okay, let's submit and then think a bit. Yeah, but I'm being a bit slow, right? I'm pretty sure. Actually, no, it's not so bad and only one correct pretest, passing pretest submission. So I guess pretests are quite strong. 88 submissions and one passes pretests. Wow. Just wow. Okay, so I guess this probably means that my solution is correct and I shouldn't spend too much time, too much more time on this one. Let's move to the next one. Mm. Yeah, I think it should be good. It feels a bit weird, but I think it should be good, yeah. Okay, so what's on what's up is problem D. Here there is a graph, undirected graph is in vertices and it's connected and we want to give a label to each vertex such that all vertices where difference and labels is less than one are connected and the rest are not. So it's like almost like splitting the graph into layers. So we should have clicks, like numbers corresponding to each label is a click. And then those clicks are connected with uh, additional full bipartite graphs in sequence. Okay, so because the total number of rows of graph is not very big, I guess clicks cannot be very big as well. So, what can we do though? So, how do we distinguish them? How do we find a way to to de to to determine those clicks? So, I guess if we look at Any two vertices are not connected. And fix them and say that one of them will have smaller numbers than the other, then the rest should be, I guess, uniquely determined because... No, maybe not, actually. Yeah, it should be, I guess. Okay, and now there is some path between them. 
uh, because they are connected. So let's find the shortest path between them, then it's obviously will be... Oh, shortest path is a good idea. So shortest path gives us uh, like the assignment of labels. Consecutive labels, obviously. Yes, the graph is connected, so it should be a path, and each difference cannot be more than one, so it will be exactly one, right? Because what's, what's the point? And then we can find this. So I guess... Basically, we just need to find a vertex with the smallest label, and then shortest path from this vertex will give us the labeling. And then we should just check that... Uh, check that the answer uh, is valid. So, but if we start with any vertex, find shortest path and it will go both ways. But again, it should be split into two components, essentially. So if we build a tree of shortest path, any tree of shortest path, uh, then there should be exactly two edges going out of the first uh, vertex. Oh, maybe more than two, but all adjacent. Oh, yeah, this is a special case, right? So the vertices in zeros label will also be. So it may take any vertex and look at all its neighbors. Then it, they will be of three types: those that are connected to all. Okay, so first, if it's a full graph, if there are only two different labels, then it's a full graph, I think, right? So if there are only two different labels, then everything is connected, yes. So if there are three labels, then we can should be able to find the vertex, such that, basically, there are two of its neighbors that are not connected by themselves, right? So like uh, three vertices where we have two edges, but not the third one. And that means, okay, let's just, okay, so somebody solved this problem as well, it shouldn't be that hard. We can label them like this, and then everything continues kind of automatically from this. Yeah, so first we just, the only thing is we need is we need to find those vertex, and then all these neighbors will split into three parts. Basically, some of them are connected to all others, and there are two groups which are not connected to each other but within themselves, and that gives us and that gives us the components. Okay. Yeah, I think that should be fine. And so... But if we start from a vertex that is... has a label that is a minimum, uh, then... Uh, all its neighbors will be connected to each other and then yeah I guess it will be a bit harder so I guess ideally we would find a way to find this two vertices three vertices in a chain that form a chain but the, there is no edge between the ends of the chain so after this everything is super straightforward and there are no yes, there are no loops or multiple edges. So I guess uh, the first case that we need to handle anyway is if the graph is complete. So we read the number of cities and number of roads, and if m is equal n times n minus one divided by two. Is there a such a simple? No, actually, no. Nice. Oh no, 510, right? Yeah, 510. Then we print yes and print. So this solves the case of full graph, complete graph. 
hopefully yes it does and if not then we can find the mission edge find the path connecting them connecting the ends and uh, yeah I guess yeah I think it's kind of clear than by reducing this path we can yeah yeah now it makes sense okay so we have vertex and we'll just reduce this path until it has length 2 and then we use the solution the original solution okay let's see least vertex adjacent so again we build up my standard graph with classes Okay, now we read read the actual edges. Okay, and then we do this. So we don't even read the edges in case of full graph. Probably we can still read just to be kind of on a safe safe region separate from processing. Okay, if the graph is not full, then we can find the two vertices that are not connected. So let's say vertex A. No, actually, yeah, actually it's not so. We can reuse the same. So if we find have the shortest path. from the start, uh, which is like just a bit bread first search. So here what we do is we say mm, I was able to check the graph for correctness, I wonder. I guess we can do it with hashes. Yeah, I guess hashes makes the most sense. Okay, so okay, so just just implement breadfast search. Have a queue. Take a vertex from the queue and go for from all adjacent vertices. And then if its distance is infinity, then its distance equals core distance plus one and it comes from core and we add it to queue. Alright, and that's it. all of them okay so find the shortest paths from some vertex doesn't really matter which one oh no it does so if there are three let three layers and we find the shortest path the okay so we should find the vertex which does not have all of them adjacent right so There are less than n minus one. Then, then we find this shortest path, and it should be at least one with distance two, and this is what we need, right? So for so 
here we do c equals v, b equals v pref and break. So here we must find something. A, b, c, so if a equals null, it's bad. And then here we must find b and c. b and c we found. Okay. And then uh, we found those vertices and then now we need to find distances from B. So this will reuse. Yes. And then we find the labels. Mm -hmm. So then we find the distances from B, and then we f A and C connectivity with A and C. Okay, so now we go. Okay, so vertices with distance 1. First we assign the labels to them. Okay, and distance 0. If... Okay, that will probably should be a set. We can quickly test things. Okay, so here if v edge can so if this one is assigned to both A and C, then label equals zero. Else if the edge contains A So if it contains A, then we put label 1, else if contains C, we put minus 1. Okay, and, and I guess we should also add, yeah, let's add the same, add loops, I think it will make it easier. Yeah, let's make... So then this should be n. Yeah, I think with loops it's a bit easier. Then this can be the same. So if it's connected to a and if it's connected to c. Uh, and otherwise, if there is something that is not connected to a and not connected to c, then the answer is no. So now we labeled all of distance one, and the rest should be labeled So for the rest, they have distance at least two. So if you go follow previous ones, then we go like this. Yeah, like this, right? And we must reach one or minus one. So, oh no, but what if we reach immediately zero? Yeah, that's pretty bad, I guess. Okay, let's have a boolean. X 
explicitly remember for which vertices we have the label. And if there is no label, uh, we find the label. And then we propagate zeros for those. Oh, uh, yeah, like this. Yeah, that's nice. And so now we have to just go through vertices. If we distance is at least two and label equals zero. So then the answer is no. Otherwise, we have all the labels now. And now what we need to do is just to check. So first we check the number of edges. Okay, so first we can find the smallest label. subtracted I find the largest label yeah takes me some time probably I should think about solving other problems find the largest label then we have count for each label It's a number of occurrences of each label. So first edges within and then if I plus one they are too large as than expected. If the number of edges doesn't match, we say no. And otherwise, uh, yeah, actually, then we don't need this extra magic. We can just use the same check, right? So, number. We just get some assignment of labels. And then we check if the number of edges matches. And if it doesn't match, then we just need to check that all existing edges are good, right? So. There is an edge between vertices with distance more than one, then we print no. Otherwise, we have all those edges and they're all different. And the total count matches, so I think we are good. Yeah. Should work, I think. Let's see, maybe it even matches the outputs. No, but in this case it doesn't really matter. So, yeah. Can it matches no in the last case? Yeah, this is a task where probably there are a huge amount of possible hacks and bugs and other stuff. Let's see, only one person with four problems. So far I'm doing reasonably well. Of course it depends on whether my solution works here and whether I should want to spend time checking it. Oh my god, it works for almost two seconds out of three. Interesting, but hopefully it's just reading the input, so hopefully it will be like this in all cases. 
again so let's just double check the logic uh, so uh, we start if we have all edges and we bail out immediately with ones otherwise we find the vertex such that not all vertices are its adjacent ones so we can have a test for this right so yeah uh, let's say three vertices and two edges one two one three so here using one as a starting vertex doesn't really work okay so what it will choose i wonder yes two one three yeah that works okay so we find that one we find shortest path and we find the vertex distance two that gives us a path of length two that does not have a direct edge and then we find short distances from B and by whether it goes through A or through C we can find uh, yeah we can find the assignment uh, because yeah if it contains A otherwise mm -hmm. and if it doesn't have label we find the label which is uh, Yes, so basically just by previous links and find the expected number of edges. And count the edges, including the ones on the largest component. The number doesn't match and all adjacent ones and there are no loops so if we have all those edges and yeah i think we're good okay i think this problem is good done let's see whether we are yeah in second place with all my our usual friends around okay those are some attempts on all the remaining problems let's see maybe we should now read many of them and choose the one we like more Okay, so this problem is about a sequence of numbers. Uh, okay. Again, they play a game. Okay, so this game I think is well known, right? So basically there is a sequence of numbers and players take numbers from the beginning or from the end and one wants to maximize the remaining number and the other wants to minimize the remaining number and i think basically the idea is that the So let's say we have an even amount of numbers, then the first player can force uh, the second player to, basically let's color them with two colors, black and white in sequence, and then the first player can always eat white carrots, and the second player will be forced to always eat black a black carrot, and so in the end we will end up with some black carrot but the second player can choose which one so basically we look at all white carrots and all black carrots uh, and the first player assuming it wants to he wants to maximize for example he needs to find the minimum of all whites and minimum of all blacks see which one is bigger and try to reach that one I think no but this doesn't make any sense right because for example if both those bad things are on the left he can actually take both of them and still get a better result Wait, so this is a well-known problem, but I don't remember the solution. It's not very good. Okay, so we have... 
we have this uh, what else can we do right oh actually no maybe I'm okay so what is my problem so let's say it starts with one two Oh, I guess, yeah, it's much easier, right? So we have a sequence, let's say it's an even, has an even number of elements, and the middle element is something. Then second player can force the game to end the middle element, right? Because by doing, by doing symmetric strategy. So first player will never be able to get something better than the middle element. First player at the same time after his first move uh, he can essentially so let's say we have three elements and he can force uh, the game to end with either that element or the one to the right of it, right? So let's say we have five elements. First player removes the first. Then, yeah, first player can force to get one of those uh, next to the middle elements. Okay, so... Basically, we can see that Yeah, in that case it's still... So first player can force to choose like minimum of two. So basically let's say first player maximizes. So middle element is, let's say, AM. So we know that the value of the game is at least AM. At most, because second player can force this number to be the final one. Uh, but we know that the value of the game is at least so if any of the adjacent ones is bigger then the first player can just point to those two to get exactly AM so it's at least a maximum of AM minus 1 AM plus 1 and then minimum of this and AM, right? So then we basically yeah, so first player can horse, but maybe second player can do better, right? So hmm. Okay, should I try to Google? Yeah, something like this. Yeah. This is the question, right? Oh no, but they take no, they take numbers. So the thing about we're not interested about the sum. I see. So the problem I remember when they're interested about the sum. But not when they want one remaining number is what we want to maximize. Yeah. 
Yes, so I guess no, this is not. What's the problem? It's pretty interesting, so let's spend some more time on it. We can see whether. Okay, it gets solved by two people in 13 minutes. Wow. Turns out it's super easy. Okay. Need to think faster. Mm, so we have this middle number and we want it to. Okay, so the first player can force maximum of those, but for example, middle, middle number is quite big, let's say 5, and then two adjacent numbers are small, let's say 1 and 1. Then, uh, after first player makes a move, second player basically can choose, instead of this value, any of the adjacent ones. Alright. Yes. So I guess we have the middle value, let's say 5. And then there are the next... say 3 and 2 here for example so uh, to the sides so the first player can actually after it removes some end second player can switch the focus to become this number essentially right so oh yeah that's true right so first player can e second player can easily make this adjacent number to be the new middle because of this, basically, after first player's move. Yeah, so I think the value of the game is given by this, like, maximum of AM minus 1, AM plus 1, and then minimum of this, and AM. Because yeah, second player can force AM, first player can force at least this, one by choosing one of the sides and then making sure we end up with those two numbers and second player can also after first player does a move can force the can choose which one of those to get so yeah I think this is the right answer okay so now we can make some number of moves before and see what can be the remaining ones I guess so basically we just find the answer if this middle is somewhere okay and if there is an odd number of places and there are two middle places and it looks like the answer will be maximum of two middle places, right? Because uh, second player can force the answer to be one of the two middle places. Uh, right. And first player can okay. So for example, let's say we have four. So first player removes one of them. Second player uh... yeah, I guess basically first player. If he wants to get the vaccine of the middle place, he removes that this one and becomes a center, he becomes a second player. Yes, okay. So that makes sense. So I guess we, for each engine position we know the score and now we just need to see what is the smallest number of elements to remove to get this as engine position. Okay. Okay, so that would be a result of length n. Okay, so 
Here's an interesting problem, and I think I somehow spend a bit too much time on it. But I hope I can avoid making bugs, right? So if we remove all but one, it's a special case, right? So. So we just put the maximum in there. Otherwise, we have two or three. So let's start with two. So we have uh, those two as the middle. Uh, so now we need to. To the left we have i, and to the right we have n minus one i uh, minus two, right? So, for example, if i equals zero and n equals two, then we have zero, right? And so here we say So we take how many we need to balance, so maximum minus minimum. Alright, and then we go by triples. Similar things. Okay. And finally, we need to propagate. print the answer. Yeah, I think that's it. And it passes all samples even. Okay, let's submit here. Yeah, I think this would be good, so... It's kind of funny that games always ends in the middle, but that's how it goes, right? Seems so never pays to go outside of the middle in this game. Okay, so now we have five problems and some people sold F but not G, which means probably going with F next is still the best move. Yeah, but we are ten minutes slower than McKeef. Okay, let's see what we can do with problem F. So Here we have a sequence of numbers and uh, requests. So changes each digit x to digit y on a segment and never changing things to zero. So the number of digits stays the same, it means. And then we need to find the sum of a sequence. Okay. So it looks like we should do it basically separately using by each position. It's like a completely separate problem, and then we have a separate sequence of digits and yeah, we change all digits x to y and we find the sum of all digits on the range 
Yeah. I guess we could to take this to extreme we can just have a set of set of positions of occurrences of each digit in each position. And then for a query we should just take those sets of positions and Uh, yeah, and just find uh, yeah, find the num amount. So this will be cool if we have a data structure that can split, like Cartesian tree, which stores a number of elements. But let's see, we can do something simpler with an interval tree probably so yeah if we have an interval tree then for each segment has a sequence of like unpropagated changes like basically digit x changes to y and remember the number of occurrences of each digit such nice interval tree each digit at each position I guess yeah then it's kind of but we don't need actually in each position right we just need this number like one times plus ten times number of occurrences on that position basically the contribution of this digit in a sense to the number because it will change all at once right so basically contribution of each digit and then yeah quite simple with a simple interval tree so it should be quite fast code okay so we read lengths and number of queries and we read the numbers have these contributions of each digit at each position like this we can find the contribution of each digit at each position and now we will have uh yeah we don't even need to propagate down right because oh no we do yeah we do okay trip and then what we have is we also have remap of the digits and Yeah, let's make those. So 
here if if we have a leaf of the tree then we just need to copy mm -hmm. and it should be long right so that we can fit it How many we have here? Yeah, there's hundred thousand. Should be fine. Otherwise, we split in half. Needs the parts. Let's have also. Identity to be checked. Have remap equals new boolean. such stupid box. And we also should have a sum for every vertex. Make sense to update it so frequently, or does it? Yeah, probably we can afford to compute it. Okay, so now we have this initialization of the tree, and now we have the queries. Let's check what type of a query is this. If we get a query of type 1, then we get int left. From digit to digit. And we do 3 remap. Uh, and we return. Otherwise first we should make sure this node has identity remapping. Oh no but leaves can not so basically our invariant will be that we have this contribution of each digit and tree contrib and then we remap it using this remapping in the node. So if uh, so if we have exactly the node, then we should just apply this remapping on top of... So all digits that map to SRC should go to DST now, right? So... Everything uh -huh. Ok 
Okay, so we change the remapping and we are done because contrips are before remapping. Alright. Or maybe it's better to have contrips after remapping. No, but then with leaves. No, but why it's wrong with leaves? Oh, because then we will need to change contrips here, which is not nice. Yes. So the other option would be uh, so first if we have a remapping here we should propagate it down Propagate it down by saying that So we take what I remap there and then apply this remapping on top. Mm -hmm. Here we don't have any remapping anymore because we propagated it down and now we need to call remapping for children so we called remapping for children uh, and then we need to update the number for the root. Alright, so basically we need to say that three can trip and then we iterate over children and then we say three can trip i plus equals not I. Yeah. Mm. Three country. Uh, so remap. Where does child remap number I? Uh, yes. So here we apply the remap to get trick on trip yeah and for leaves we don't ever have to change trick on trip which is nice yeah that should work and now we just need to handle the queries so need to have left and right Here we have the method Okay, so this method we have here Again, this one returns long, and here we basically have 
the same logic essentially. So here we return zero. If we need to find this one, then we just apply the remapping. So Here we just do the same essentially. That's it, right? So it should work. A bit too easy. Okay, tests didn't. Oh, there are no samples. Yes, as usual. Doing things early in the contest has its own issues. Okay, let's see. Okay, somehow I cannot copy and paste this block. Okay. So does it work? No index out of bounds. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. To have a bit bigger arrays. Now it magically works. Yeah, too much code, but let's submit. Pretests at least will tell me whether I should check for something definitely or Okay, so far, yeah, a few people with six problems. Yeah, wrong answer, okay. Now we need to think, or not to need to debug, at least on time limits, right? So what can be wrong here? Let's see. Numbers are up to the 10 to the power of nine. So, we have contributions of every digit, including zeros. Computed correctly, hopefully. Then we have a new tree which takes contributions. And then we have propagate, which let's say already remap somehow. And then we remap this according to the root. Oh, but propagate must have update as well, right? Yeah, so that was quite stupid. Otherwise, after propagate, it's not correct anymore, right? Yeah, because it's not remapped. Yeah, stupid bug. Remap I root times three can trip I root. And here we have the remap. She does. Okay. Hopefully now it's good. Yeah, it should be fine. Probably should be a bit more careful, but Hopefully it's fine now. We can concentrate on the hardest problem. Yeah. Time limit is hopefully not an issue. Time limit, wow. Okay. Not so easy after all. So to the arrays are not good, I guess. Uh, what else? So now the number of operations we do is like 10 times in various places. 
I guess we can because we replace only one number. But still, it's kind of. I doubt we can do much better, actually. Because, yeah. Time limit. So we do. It's only 100,000. 10 times log, right? So not 100 times, no? 10 times. So why is it? What can we do about this, right? So we have this three sum and three remap, so slow thing. We even have this have remap thing which supposedly does things fast. Makes things a bit faster. Okay, so we can do, do this. like this so that we have less a bit less computations don't do update for one, the ones we didn't to propagate yeah mm -hmm. yeah not much I yeah, just get rid of two GRAs and submit again I guess you can be asymptotically better so I guess I just need to make it a mess. Not the most pleasant thing to do. Okay, no to GRAs and no extra updates. This will hopefully be enough. Yeah, now I will be not very well positioned. Yeah, now it's much faster. Okay. Probably extra updates would be enough. Okay, so now I'm losing 400 points. My God.
Okay, let's move to the hardest problem. We can also challenge for D, I think. So nobody has successful challenges in the top, so probably it doesn't work too well. Okay, let's move on the hardest problem. Move to the hardest problem. So here we have two strings uh, S and T with zeros and ones. Uh, okay, so we want to find like some encoding for A and some encoding for B so that after replacing A and B, some of it, so the two given strings are end up being the same. Okay, and now we have two strings with question marks. Can there any, any submissions on this problem? No. Now we have two strings with question marks and we need to replace each question mark with A or B and then find the flexibility, so the number. I guess we need to find, we have two strings with A, B and question marks. And we need to find the number of ways to replace each question mark with A or B and pick up, come up with two encodings for A and B so that the strings are the same. So we can sum in different ways, like we can first iterate over O oh, and each encoding has to be of length at most N. Okay, problem looks nice. Maybe it doesn't even involve some magical string algorithms, but maybe it does. So let's think about a bit about it. Yeah, but other than that, I guess if nobody solves this problem, then yeah, this will be the result, I guess. And maybe I can find the challenge, but yeah, probably that's better left for the end. Let's first try to solve this one. So... Okay, so what can we do here? So we have uh, basically some prefix of the strings is the same, and then one of the strings has A and the other has B. It means that one of them should be prefix of the other, essentially, unless the strings are the same. Yeah. So first we separately count the number of ways to make the strings exactly the same and then we need to just add, yeah, no matter what the encoding is. Yeah, so now the strings will be different, so A and B, so one of them will be a prefix of the other. A must be, encoding of A must be a prefix of encoding of B and then So I guess, let's say B is longer one, here we have A, we need to look at what other one, so basically here we have A, 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 and then B, and here we have just B, and that kind of uniquely determines everything, right? No, actually, no, maybe not. So yeah, but in general we kind of see what... Okay, right, so and it matches B matches some prefix 
of this, which might cover the B in the first line. So first line we have some A's and then B, and A short and then B, or equal, and then we have a B that matches at least one A, but at most it can cover the B itself. And then what properties can we have? So we know that B has a prefix that is equal to a suffix. It's actually B is periodic, right? So if this is equal to B, no, but if it's A and then B and here, so we have a A and then longer B and the longer B here, then we don't have any such, no, we still have prefix of B that is equal to a suffix of B. So yes, essentially length of A tells us peri period of B, right? So B is periodic after, yeah, B is necessarily periodic after with the period B in the encoding of A, right? So basically we have A and then we have B, which is um, some number of periods of A plus uh, an incomplete uh, period. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point, right? So then we just need to essentially, and if it's an incomplete period like this, so I guess we find B, we find its minimal period, let's say it's P, then A must be some amount of repetitions of this minimum period, and we can count the number of strings with given minimum periods, yeah, I'm pretty sure. Okay, so then how can we have a quality uh, okay, so B can have mini period and maybe some suffix right oh, okay see. so oh but then yeah it might be yeah, it might be me no complex yeah it might be more complex. Anyway, so we can have some string B and some string A, which is its prefix, and then if you repeat A many times, you cover all B. So the question is, how can we get equality here? Mm -hmm. I guess in many ways. We are still not exactly... Oh, but I guess, yeah, if you have the greatest common divisor of lengths of A and B, then we kind of operate in blocks of this size and we can compress them. Yeah, so we can say that greatest common divisor of lengths of A and B is 1 always. Because otherwise we can just compress those blocks. Uh, yeah, basically all this matters for those two blocks. Are they equal or not? So not very interesting. Okay, so now we have this greatest common divisor equal to 1. And... So the only way to get equal length is actually to take B A's and A B's. Uh, length of B A's and length of A B's. Because the greatest common divisor is 1. Okay. So, which means uh, that... But after B can an A match here? Why not, I guess? Yeah, it's not. Not obvious. Yeah, it's not obvious what happens. Any successful changes in the standings? No, not yet. Okay, it's not obvious what happens. How do we deal with this thingy? So we have... Um, have a 
certain number of Yeah, it can match in any way. It can be A here, then B here. It all, it all kind of can be almost arbitrary. And with question marks, right? It's hard to see. Yeah, it's not easy to, do, to see what to do. So what matters? Mm, yeah, which suffixes of A and B match which prefixes of A and B, but... Oh, and I, A is this prefix of B. But Still, yeah, still it's not, not entirely obvious how to deal with this stuff, because the strings are long, right, so we can have almost, could think that it could be like greedy, right, so we start with B and then put some A's, and yeah, we can put a B at any time, actually, because it matches. B is a prefix of A concatenated many times. Some prefix. So, which means that we can have B and then A. Oh, so the question is, I guess, will the match will always look will always look like a, a concatenated many times? Maybe it's true. We just need to find. Yeah, actually, that's a good point. Maybe it necessarily has to, or or two Bs. Right? So we have B and B, but if B matches A, then before we get equal length again, is it true that here we have many A's uh, and B's, and then here we have any, also many A's and B's, and but the resulting string. <laughs> Or not, so can it be like this? So let's say A is equal to, let's say 0, 1, and B is equal to 0, 1, 0. So we have Yeah, but then to match 1 we cannot, right? so we need to Yeah, somehow it seems to be that if we ever have a B here, let's say, then here we must have a 1 and we cannot. So in a sense, oh, I guess we can have this A is equal to 0, 1, 0, 1 and B is equal to 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1. Yeah, that's a good example. Oh yeah, maybe A is equal to 0, 0 and B is equal to 3 zeros. Then we can have equality at 5 zeros. This is not a multiple of A and not a multiple of B. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but basically I guess maybe that's true actually. That in order to have this, A and B have to be repeats on some small string. So can it be that uh, can we have a match where A and B are not repeats on the same small pattern? Maybe we can't. Because if we do so let's say again A is zero one and B is zero one zero, can we have equality? Seems no, because after we have B, here we have, let's say, 0, 1, then here we must start with 1, and we can't, because all of them start with 0, in a sense. Yeah, I can't, I guess, trust this thingy. Okay, so basically, it's always true that A and B are always repeats of some small period. So again, so we have some period, then we have A, and we have B times this period. 
Oh, but then encodings are obviously the same only if, if and only if length matches, right? Just can be so easy? It seems so, yes. Yeah, it seems so. Yeah, it actually seems that it's so easy. Yeah. Okay, so the question is just how we count this stuff, right? So we find some smallest period, obviously, and for those cases, not over over count. So we have strings which are not. Okay, so we need to kind the count the number of uh, strings. Which do not have a smaller maybe I'm missing just do not have any repeats inside, right? So we have one zero. Yeah, just don't have any repeats inside of each length. Uh, this is easy to do. Uh, and then log in time. And then if you can find all divisors, but we can. And uh, then we just need After we found this, we need to find the number of ways to pick two numbers up to some number. So is it number of solutions of a linear equation? Oh no, but we also have, we know how many A's and how many B's we have. Well, fair enough. And we also, so the case where the strings are equal is handled Yeah, it's handled separately. Okay. So if the lengths are the same, I count the name a way to make them, a number of ways to make them equal. some time but should be solvable but I guess it's not, not the only one thing think should be solvable okay This is the number of ways to make them equal. And we need to update result. Basically just 2 to the power of n minus 1. n plus 1 minus 1. Right? Mm. 
So this is not counted in any of those cases, but let's say we have a a and length three. So then a can be anything and b can be anything. And anything we have two plus four plus eight. They have to be non empty, right? Yes. That would be Uh, 14 times 14 196 no this is not good okay like this okay now we can count ways equal properly so now if the strings are not equal then they have to be the number of non-periodic and then we subtract this because have a periodic string then uniquely determined by yes so we remove periodic ones periodic two yeah it should be fine so this way we found the non-periodic strings of each length so we have now a non-periodic strings of length p and so a has to be the string x times and y times and we have to find the number of such x and y so that we can have a mm -hmm. so I guess oh I guess but the matter of matters is the difference right so yeah So here we have one of them will have x and the other will have x plus difference and they cannot be the same. Alright, oh, so they can also be when a equals encoding font a equals encoding of b. Yeah, that's one case, right? So, yeah, one case doesn't seem to be different from others. Okay, so now we have period, and now they are different in this way. So, we have and a
so now we counted counted the balance in a sense so now when we know the period and the difference so basically a is okay we should iterate So now we have an A times L A plus N B times L A plus D times P. Uh, yeah, we have this equal to zero, right? So We can increment or decrement in various ways. Okay, so this is a combinatorial problem what remains. But still we need to count it somehow. Okay, yeah, this combinatorial problem I didn't think about. Okay, so we have So the total balance we know. Okay, so yeah, we can just have for each Possibilities basically for an A and B. We know how many ways are there to get each each of them, right? Some combination number. And then we have an A times L A. So they're still independent, right? The balance of A and the balance of B. Okay, no, actually, no, it's not true. So we have sum, like C lengths. So NA minus NA plus and B is equal to C lengths minus D lengths. It's a constant. Okay, so now we have an A plus and B times length A plus and B times difference times P. All right. Yeah, so this cancels. Oh no, it doesn't cancel out though. Yeah, what we need to find essentially the number of ways to uh, number of ways to represent this okay so we have b times difference times p should be zero right so basically we need to know la plus So 
so we need this to be divisible by difference in length and have the right sign and okay yes it doesn't look good Okay, so I don't know how to fix it quickly, right? So I know what I need to count, and I know it's countable quickly, but I don't know how. It's a pity. I guess let's try to hug something. Yeah, I guess any successful hugs? Whatever. Okay, good. I know what to hack on B on the same person now. Doesn't look good. It is B. And uh, I doubt that. Okay, so I don't know how to do this last formula quickly. Man, it's so close. So P cancels out actually. So yeah, we have to con constant times LA plus and B not dif times difference equals zero and we need to kind found. Oh, but then we can find if we know LA, oh no, we don't know both this and difference and we can find. But it's too much, okay. Too much, right? Okay, then I guess let's lock problem D. Okay, let's see what we have for D. Hey, come on, why can't I see the solution? What's going on? Oh, it's C, sorry. Nobody solved D in my room. Oh my god. Okay, this was probably a stupid hacking attempt, so I thought that this solution doesn't and I lost a place because of this, oh god, but maybe, anyway, I tried to do my best. So, I thought that the problem with this solution was that, no, I cannot see it anymore, oh my god. So, the problem with the solution was that it somehow didn't have this logic to find enough letters, but I guess probably in the beginning they removed the extra letters that are not useful. Yeah, and then it works just fine, because if you count how many letters each player will put, then it works just fine. Oh my god. That was not my best round, but 
thanks for watching and yeah hope you found something interesting and let's see what the results show you're losing this place third place was well i guess aiming for higher is always better than just waiting but also should have sold g i wonder what's the problem here so it's wrong answer okay wrong answer could be caused by this handling of empty of equal strings for example Anyway, uh, thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.